All right. So this morning's message, I titled it A New Year to Embrace the New Covenant. All right. We're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 26. But before we get there, you know, just to say that every time at this time, people come up with all these different resolutions that they're going to do. Right. Yeah. Uh, I was listening to overheard some guys complaining in the gym yesterday. Oh, Lord, wait for the next two weeks, man. Everybody's going to be in our way. Just give them a couple of weeks to get in and get their stuff, you know, and then they'll be gone. They'll move out of the way. And then, and then at the clinic the other day, somebody was asking me, well, are you ready to bring in the new year? You know, and I don't really know exactly what he had in mind, but I'm like, you know what? It's just another year to be truthful. Uh, but it is an opportunity to be resolved, right? Because we talk about resolutions, but it's an opportunity to be resolved to trust God and what he's provided regarding the areas of my life that he's dealing with me about, right? Each and every one of us, God is dealing with us about areas in our own life. Uh, and we can trust the Lord to know that he has a way that he's dealt with that. Amen. Whatever those things are, whether it be food issues or health issues. A lot of times that's what people have in their mindset this year. I'm going to do something new with the way I eat, with the way I'm taking care of myself. So it could be food, health issues, attitude adjustments. I don't know if you've ever had issues with attitude adjustments. Lord knows I sure have. Right. So food, health issues, attitude adjustments, just being a better worker. You know what I'm saying? I mean, some, look, there's been times in my life that whenever I got to work, I worked hard just as hard and not harder than anybody else. But my problem was I, I didn't seem to get there on time like I should. I can remember early on in my years as an RN, I was always one of the first ones wanting to go home, you know, just different <laughs> things like that. Um, but or it could be the worst of sin issues, whatever the case may be, the new covenant, because that's really what I'm talking to you about this morning is the new covenant provides access to the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The new covenant provides access to the power of the Holy Spirit, which gives us the strength we need to do the right thing. Whatever the right thing is. Amen. You know, that's the beautiful thing about the, if we want to call it the message of the cross, the new covenant, the, the, the message of his sacrifice. It, allows, it, it makes one aware that the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of us. And when we yield to, when, our, when the object of our faith is right in what Christ has done, not so much in what we're doing. Because listen to me, when, when your faith is built upon a works-based Message and, and don't don't go to sleep on me while I'm talking to you about this because the majority of churches, if you grew up, if you went to another church, it's more likely that you were hearing a works based message than you were hearing a grace based message. And whenever you're in the midst of a works based message, your focus is on what you're accomplishing for the Lord. Your focus is on how much you're getting it done right and how much and then the guilt that's connected to when you don't get it done right. Because Lord knows none of us can ever really accomplish what it is that we're wanting to do anyway. That's right? right. That's right. And so whenever we have those those issues going on in our <coughs> lives and we're focused on what we're doing and where we're failing rather than on what the Lord has done and the victory that he's given us. Amen. Amen. So whatever it is that we're dealing with, the Lord is there to give us the strength. That we need in order to walk with him properly. Amen. So we're going to take some look, a look at the at the new covenant. Because like I said, it's a new year for us to embrace the new covenant. So whatever it is that you have need of this morning, I want you to know that the Lord can give you the strength that you need for it this morning. Amen. So let's look at Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read verses 26 through 28. Got a lot of scripture this morning. Hope you're ready. He's got and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, that word testament is another way to say covenant. And, and the word literally means a contract or a will. It's a covenant. All right. And, you know, if, if we get time, when we get to it regarding the word will, I find that one of the scriptures that I use uh, is kind of an interesting way to see this particular passage out of Hebrews. 
But right now, I just want you to know it's a contract, it's a covenant. Some people used to make such a big deal when I first started teaching the Bible. And I kept saying time and again in the Greek, the word literally means a contract. And they would say, oh, but it's so much bigger than a contract. Well, yes, it is. Of course it is because it's a contract made by God. Typically, covenants were always cut between representatives. A lot of times when we see it in the Old Testament, it had to do with uh, two different nations coming together and making covenant with one another. Uh, and, and you would see one representative of a nation that would represent the, an individual that would represent this nation. An individual represent this nation. They would come together. They would form the covenant together. And in Old Testament times, I've explained this before, they would cut the carcasses of animals like God did in Genesis 15 when he had Abraham do it. They'd lay those carcasses aside and then they would walk through the middle of them. So a sacrifice was sealing the contract or the covenant together. And they would say that whoever breaks this covenant made the same happen to them. And so we see in that covenant that God cut with Abraham a, a foreshadowing of what he would do with Christ, with, to, for us in Christ. Um, but the interesting or the beautiful thing about this covenant we're talking about this morning is that Jesus, and I said this recently, who was the word that spoke the worlds into existence. Amen. Jesus, the eternal word that spoke the worlds into existence, became a man. He was the representative of heaven. He became a man and he became the representative of mankind. The word of God calls him the son of man. And he was the sacrifice that made the covenant come together. Amen. God, because God could find no one greater to swear by, he swore by himself. It's a covenant or a contract that cannot be broken. You may break it. I may break it. But God is standing true to his covenant. Amen. Praise God. We're trying to convince people about the message of the cross. You know, I still think of my early days when the Lord was giving me, flooding my mind with so much revelation having to do with the gospel that I had really never understood before. I'd listen to a bunch of preachers tell me what the Bible was saying. And then all of a sudden it was like scales fell from my eyes. And as I just simply began to read the word of God and the Holy Spirit revealing things to me, I began to see that what I had been told in the past was not what the scripture was saying. And so I would try to talk to people about, and I would use the terminology of the message of the cross. And to be truthful, many people were having an issue because they didn't like Brother Swaggart, and he was using the same terminology, the message of the cross. And so you were getting lumped in with Brother Swaggart. I don't have a problem with being lumped in with Brother, Brother Swaggart. But what I will say is this. It's not the message of the cross because Brother Swaggart says it's the message of the cross. It's the message of the cross because it's what's written in the scriptures. And you can either find it. In, I'm not over here just to regurgitate what another man says, no matter how long he's been studying the Bible have we studied the Bible to show ourselves approved right a right a workman that rightly divides the word of truth he need not be ashamed and so I would go to people and I would say hey the message of the cross oh man that message of the cross word was just used one time in the book of Corinthians and it was just a, a, a one particular situation because they're always trying to come against when they got a problem with the message, the problem with the messenger, because it comes against everything that you were taught before. That's right. When it tells you that all of your works-based Christianity is a bunch of filthy rags that has to be thrown out the door, and everything that you've learned because you thought you were creating your own righteousness based upon what you did, and you judged your righteousness compared to someone else's righteousness, and it made you feel good on the inside when you looked down on them and looked up at yourself, that doesn't fly in the, in, right. in the mind of God. No, there's one righteousness. It's his son. His name is Jesus. That's what it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. I'm not making this up. The righteousness of God apart from the law has now been manifest. What is it Paul talking about? He's talking about Jesus. The Old Testament showed us the character and the righteousness of God. But now the true righteousness of God given to man as a gift showed up in the person of the Christ. And there's only one way for you and I to be able to get that righteousness. Hallelujah. He had to die on the cross. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but he had to die on the cross and where that exchange took place. But I would try to tell people, man, the message of the cross. And they'd come back with all this stuff. And then, you know, so now my mind starts thinking, I'm like, okay, well, I got to, I got to be able to see it. I got to be able to prove it from the scriptures because that's how, that's how my mind works. And so I would use that particular passage of scripture. Something stuck out to me where Jesus was doing communion with his disciples, where Jesus was doing the last supper with his disciples. Because look what he said right there. He said, this bread is my body that will be given for you. It will be broken for you. This bread represents my body, who I am. 
the manna from heaven, the bread from heaven. He told him, Moses didn't give you that bread from heaven. My father gave you that bread that comes from heaven. Who he was, the bread. This cup is the blood of the new Testament, the new covenant. This cup is the blood of the new covenant. Now, when I look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 through 24, two different times in Corinthians, right here, the actual, and not really in this scripture, but in, it's 1 Corinthians 1 18, where it actually uses the word message of the cross. And in the Greek, the word is actually logos, uh, which could be word of the cross, message of the cross, preaching of the cross. And that was where I was having this disturbance. I can remember this one particular guy really challenging me on that, you know. Um, but what I want to say to you is that I can prove that this is the gospel from the beginning, starting with the fall. And I don't even know Amen. how many times I've done it. I, you probably don't even listen to me anymore. You probably tuned me out. And every time that I'm doing it, I'm repeating to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm repeating to you in the Old Testament Amen. after the fall, whenever God said, hey, your fig leaves aren't going to work. I have to kill an animal. I have to take its skin and clothe you with the righteousness. This innocent animal who had nothing to do with your failure, who had nothing to do with your sin, I'm going to have to provide you with a covering. And in that, he is already preaching the message of the cross. The sacrifice that had to be offered in order to make us right with God again. And we can go through the entirety of the Old Testament scriptures. We can talk about the Exodus passage, what we, which we always do in the painting of the doorpost. I will pass over you when I see the blood. No longer guilty because, not because of anything you did, but other than you were obedient and believed by you took action through faith and you killed the lamb and you painted the doorpost of your house and you ate the lamb on the inside of your house. You took action by faith. And because of that, guilt was not laid upon you. The guilt was laid upon the lamb. This is the perfect picture, Old Testament, thousands of years before Jesus would ever show up on the earth, painting the picture, making us aware, amen, that God had a plan. Praise God. Yes. And ultimately, whenever John the Baptist would say it on the banks of the Jordan River, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away Hallelujah. the sin of the world. God progressively revealing his message to us. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 22 through 24. And once again, we're looking at this in correlation with the passage we just read out of Matthew 26 where Jesus said, this is my body. It will be broken for you. This is the cup of the new covenant, my blood that will be shed for you. So he says right here, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews. It's a stumbling block unto the Greeks. It's foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul didn't say, oh, just for you Corinthian churches, we preach Christ crucified. No, Paul said, this is my message. This is what I preach, Christ and him crucified. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. This is what he says right here. For I determined to not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I can prove to you it wasn't just Corinth, but we're not going to go there. Galatians. He said, this one thing that I have to ask of you, who has bewitched you? Who cast a spell upon you? Before your very eyes, Jesus was proclaimed as though he were crucified before your very eyes. And now you started in the spirit and you're going to finish off in your flesh. You're going to attempt through the works of your flesh to gain righteousness for your life. Whenever you started off hearing the message of Jesus Christ and what he did for you at the cross. No, this isn't just for Corinth. This is for the entirety right. of the God. This is for every human being that's ever walked on the face of the earth. And Colossians 2, 6 says the same way you received him. How'd you receive him? You heard the gospel. You believed by faith is the same way you shall continue to walk in him. The same object of faith, Jesus Christ and him crucified, continuously believing that on a daily basis, puts you in a standing of righteousness in the eyes of the Father and gives you access to grace, which strengthens you and empowers you. But look, 
Paul was determined that no matter how foolish these words seemed to the ignorant mind, he was not going to change the message. He changed the message. It doesn't matter whether people like it or not. It doesn't matter whether they want to show up to church or not. It doesn't. Look, they got churches that are preaching other messages. They preach workspace messages. They preach seeker sensitive messages. They got look. They got all kind of stuff out there. Find your flavor. But the apostle Paul said, "I will not change the message." Amen. There's all kind of and hallelujah. There's all kind of doctrines of devils out there. You think that you think that this is just. Some of these doctrines that we're finding that, that make the gospel more palatable or, you know, make it more tasty or make it more tolerable. You, you think that, that these are just the, the, the nuances of men or that something that they create in their own mind? No. Doctrines of devils. The word of God teaches us and warns us that in the end days there were going to be doctrines of devils. Do the preachers do it on purpose? Do they know that they're being moved upon by the enemy? No. Half the time, whenever you treat somebody wrong in public, you give them a good tongue lashing, you make them feel bad, or you do whatever it is that you do that hurts their feelings and brings a, throws mud in the face of Jesus. You didn't mean to do that. You didn't do it necessarily on purpose. Well, you might have done it on purpose, but you didn't know that you were going to be used by the devil that day. Yeah. When you responded in the flesh instead of the spirit. Most preachers don't realize whenever they're being used by the enemy. They're deceived. Oh, there's some of them out there. Let me tell you something. There's some of them out there that know what they're doing. And they have affected the entirety of the church world. And that's why I've preached so hard against some of these people. Rick Warren. <laughs> I believe he knows exactly what he's doing. And I'm not going to back up from that. You do what you want with it. It has changed the landscape of the modern church. Amen. You follow after that. Anybody that's going to tell you, I didn't, this was not in my notes, but anybody that's going to tell you, don't worry about eschatology, which is the study of end time events. Jesus will work it all out whenever he gets here. Is blasphemy. The Lord said that there's a special reward for those that study the book of Revelation. You're going to sit here and tell me that's of the Lord? No, that's completely contrary to the word of God. And if that's his heart, then Houston, we have a problem. Amen. We have to be careful about who we listen to. That's just one example. We don't even have time to get into it. But listen, the Greeks thought it was foolishness. It makes no sense to the logical, intellectual yeah. mind what we're talking about here. We've mentioned it many times before, but it makes no sense to think that the execution of a 33-year-old Jewish man on two pieces of wood outside the city called Jerusalem would result in new life, much less eternal life. It makes no sense. I call it an execution. We know it was a sacrifice, but the rest of the world, for all they know, okay, Rome executed somebody. It doesn't make any sense. How can that result in eternal life? Nevertheless, no matter how foolish it may sound to the ignorant ear, it is the truth of the gospel that results in true life. It required death to bring life. In the, mess, in the Matthew passage, Jesus said, this bread is my body. It will be offered for you. This cup is the cup of the new covenant. It, my blood will be shed for you. And then Paul said in both passages, we preach Christ. And him crucified. I'm talking about the covenant. I'm talking about the gospel. The message of the cross. The message of his sacrifice. From the beginning of the fall. All the way to the end in Revelation. The last second to last chapter. They call him the lamb seven times. That's after the devil is, is locked up. Uh, in in, in, uh, in uh, Gehenna. Which is the lake of fire. And the last death. They still call him the lamb of God seven times. From the, from the beginning of the fall to the end of all it, he bears the nail scars in his hand. Christ, who he was, his body, the bread from heaven, him crucified, the cross, his sacrifice, the shedding of his blood. Jesus Christ and him crucified, the new cup. Amen? Amen. Point number one, he had to drink the cup. If you will remember, after they ate the Last Supper, they went to the Garden of Gethsemane where he had a discussion about the cup with his father. The cup represented him as a sacrifice, which was to inaugurate the new covenant. That's a big word that just means to bring a beginning to, to initiate it, the start of something. Amen. It required a sacrifice to bring in the new covenant. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says right here in Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author of, and finisher of our faith. 
You know, I wasn't really going to, this is not why I put this scripture up here, but I want to tell you something. Jesus wrote the book. He's the author. He wrote the whole book and he wrote your book. He knows your story. And not only did he, be, did he write the intro to your story, he's also writing the body of work that lies between the intro and the conclusion. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. Don't be so distraught whenever you find yourself in the midst of a situation and you don't know how you're going to get out. Listen to me. He has the last word. we got to learn how to trust Him in the midst of it all. Amen. And He will see us through. Praise God. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. There was a joy that was laid before Jesus. He said, because of this joy, I'm going to endure the cross. He despised the shame. He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy that was set before the Lord was knowing that he would be able to purchase your, our souls for the Father. That's right. Amen. Amen. He despised the shame, though, which is he had to drink the cup. He despised the shame. I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> wouldn't you despise the shame? I mean, it was, listen, who wants to hang naked on a cross with the whole world laughing at them as they're accused for a crime that he didn't even do? I mean, I've been in a lot of trouble through my years. I'm just being honest. Did stuff I ought not done. Sat in many a police stations. A mess. And each and every time, even though I tried to convince them people I was innocent, I was guilty. Guilty as charged. Jesus, never guilty. Always obedient to the Father. Hung naked on a cross, suspended between heaven and earth. And took your shame, my shame upon him. He despised the shame, but he endured, amen, the cross. Amen. There was nothing glorious about his physical appearance on the cross. Instead, it was shameful, but it was what was required. He had to drink the cup. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 6. This is Isaiah 700 B.C., before Jesus. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, talking about Jesus, the Messiah, shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And that's a fancy, that's old King James way of saying he wasn't attractive. It wasn't an attractive thing. I'm not saying Jesus wasn't a good looking man. When we talk about the beauty of Jesus, if you ever hear me praying, I'm like, Lord, you're beautiful. I'm not talking about it. I don't know what Jesus looked like. I'm talking about his beauty, his inner beauty. Amen. The fact that his revelation of him and his love and his sacrifice and the fact that he forgives is a beautiful thing. It's both precious. It's like a treasure. Amen. I can't find enough adjectives to describe how beautiful he is. But he says right here, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Physically speaking, when, especially when this was going on, when he was beaten to shreds and, and laid upon the, and nailed upon the cross, he says he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. Don't you know people still hiding their faces from him? Because, listen, they don't realize it all the time. But when you look at a bleeding Savior, or just the concept of it, because I don't want to keep him on the cross, but you get the point. When you think of the bleeding Savior, it makes you, it, you have to deal with something. You have to come to the conclusion that you're a sinner in need of this. If this is true, you have to bow your knee to this. But man despises it. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. So that's how we looked at him, mankind, but look what he did for us. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. It required chastisement in order for mankind to have peace, and God did it to him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Don't be confused any self-righteous that might be in the house this morning or you 15 that watch on video. It ain't about your righteousness. Come on. He, he says right here, the, the, and with his stripes we are healed. What I meant to say was this. Don't be confused about that you didn't go astray because the word of God says right here, all we like sheep have gone astray. Every last one of us. 
Amen. We ain't all done it right. We like to convince people sometimes we got something going on, but no, we've all gone astray. Amen. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Oh, Lord. When, we, when you think about it like that, how he took upon him the iniquity of us all. Why? Why was a sacrifice required for a new covenant? Why did it have to be this way? It all has to do with the truth of God's word. Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. We're talking about a new year to embrace a new covenant. We're talking about the fact that he had to drink a cup. He had to drink the cup. Genesis 2, verse 17. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is God talking to Eve. Because the, the liar tried to tell her that's not what God said. And this is what God said. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt Surely die. God's word said that the result of sin is death. God is not a man that he should lie. What he says is true. Sin results in physical death. It separated them from the tree of life. But guess what? Sin results also in spiritual separation from God, which is spiritual death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the wage of sin is death, but the payment for sin was Jesus. And his payment resulted in eternal life, which is eternity in the presence of God, both physical and spiritual life. The old order was just a picture of what was to come. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 13 through 15. He had to drink the cup. We're talking about his sacrifice. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean, we've been talking about that a lot lately, sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh. So in the Old Testament, all of these ceremonial cleansings, which pointed to Jesus' sacrifice, if all that worked for that time frame, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The reason why, listen to me, the reason in the Old Testament, while the Old Testament high priest never did sit down, you know why? Anybody know? Why didn't he sit down? Thank you. His work wasn't finished. He had to keep on working because the conscience, the dead works in the, and trying to gain righteousness through your own works will never accomplish it because you know that it does not, it doesn't get rid of the guilt. But because of Jesus, the Bible says Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. After he offered himself one time for the forgiveness of sin, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Ever living. To make intercession for us. Uh, it's a beautiful picture. I don't. It just came to my head. I remember preaching it one time. Jesus stood up. The only time I know where it says. Jesus stood up in the Bible. Is when Stephen the martyr. Got stoned. In other words. After he was resurrected. And ascended to the father. Stephen says. I see one standing. Like the son of man. Amen. Jesus stood up. To watch Stephen get stoned. But he's, his work is complete. He sat down. Amen. At the right hand of the father. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Heard your conscience from dead words. How many times have you promised? I'm not saying it was just necessarily for a new year. But you promised that you were going to do this from now on. I'm going to read this many chapters. I'm going to do this. I'm going to get involved in that. And before you know it, five days are gone. You've already failed God. What happens? You're heaping condemnation and guilt all on your backside. Listen. The blood of Jesus will purge your conscience from dead Amen. works. You, you ain't going to ever get rid of the guilt and shame in your life through what you do. The only way that can ever happen is by you keeping faith in what he did. Amen. 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 He says, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament or new covenant that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. You know, I want to tell you also, 
Can you go to that next verse right there? I think it would be verse 16 because just something hit me this morning. But I just want to say this, and we don't have time to really develop this thought. But in the Old Testament, they were saved the same way that, that we're saved today. Don't ever let anybody try to tell you that there was a different plan of salvation. It was all one unified plan. But the thing of it is, is that they were saved on credit. Amen. Waiting for the day that Jesus would Amen. die. Hallelujah. For us, Jesus has already died and we look back Amen. to that day. There's no two different. Yeah, there's two different covenants, but they all spoke of the same thing. That's right. Right. Amen. One was a stopgap measure waiting until the day that Jesus would finally show up. All that painting a picture, preparing man's heart to know that the day was coming. Amen. But this is what I wanted you to see. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. This is just something brand new in my own heart. Because I always used to read this passage of scripture. Hebrews can sometimes be, you know, a little wordy. And you got to really kind of think. you got to be a thinker when you teach Hebrew. I love Hebrews. But this right here, i got a revelation of that. You know, the word testator really means one, the one who bequeaths his belongings. And, and what we said was the word covenant literally means a contract or a will. The giving of what you have to another. The Bible says that we're co-heirs with Christ. Everything that we see belongs to Jesus. That piece of property over there on the edge of the Mediterranean Sea doesn't belong to the Israelite people. It belongs to Jesus. He's going to rule and reign. Listen to me. John, John Collier got that as a revelation from the Lord whenever he was on his face before God. The Lord told him, that land doesn't belong to Israel. That land belongs to my son. They're trying to take the throne of my son away. Jesus is going to come back and he's going to rule and reign in Jerusalem. That belongs to him. This whole earth is his. He is the king of this earth. Hallelujah. Sometimes we get, listen to me, sometimes we get so focused on what's going on in the world and related to the Israelite people. You don't have to keep Sabbath in order to be right with God. You don't have to eat a Passover meal in order to be right with God. Why are you saying that, preacher? You're offending me. No, hold on a second. Jesus is the Sabbath. He is the rest of God. For the, the psalmist said, would not have said that there would be another rest to enter into if Joshua would have brought him into that rest. Because Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. You find your rest in him. Come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is, my burden is easy, and my yoke is light. Amen. And you will find rest for your weary souls. Listen to me. I know I'm getting excited, but, but Jesus is the rest. And not only that, Jesus is the Passover. The Apostle Paul said, our Passover has been sacrificed for us. We're getting so caught up in all. Oh, let me get my money to get the Jews back. God's going to take care of all that. Keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Keep your eyes focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And let God do the work that needs to be done. Give money to a ministry that's going to preach the truth and tell people how they can be free. Hallelujah. Not through a New Year's resolution, but through a resolve to the new covenant. Thank you, Jesus. Listen, I got off on all that, that little rabbit trail right there just saying this, that the death of the testator. It's all his to give. His death, and now you and I have become the sons of God through faith, and now we've become co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Oh, I, don't, I don't mean to, to harp on this, but listen to me. You got to be careful of that Jewish roots movement. I'm telling you right now, that's another thing right now. People are getting their focus. You got to have prayer shawls. You're not going to be right with the Lord unless you engage in all of this activity and keep all of these Old Testament. No, 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 no. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Hallelujah. Why do you think the Apostle Paul went around preaching vehemently against the circumcision, against the days, against keeping all of these things because they, the Jewish people that were coming into the faith were trying to say, okay, Okay, now you got Jesus, but you got to add this. The Apostle Paul said, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that brings freedom and forgiveness and gives righteousness in the eyes of God so that you and I can walk with him. That was point number one. He had to drink the cup because a sacrifice was required. Now let's take a look at this next passage of scripture. This will get us into the context of point number two, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. 
This is the Apostle Paul writing in a letter to the church of Corinth. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. So what... Point number two is this, a new covenant, a new creation. A new covenant, a new creation. Now, there's a lot of context in what we just read. I've said it many a times. We've taught Corinthians many a times. I love the book of Corinthians. But you've got to understand that underlying, there's this tension that's taking place where there's false teachers that are accusing the Apostle Paul of being a false teacher. And that was what he was talking about. He says, oh, do we need some letters of commendation from you? Do we need to get a letter of recommendation from you? Because, see, what the picture is, is that these false teachers are waving their letters of recommendation in the face of the church of Corinth. And at the same time, they're calling into question Paul's ministry. Hmm. Paul says, but we don't need a letter of commendation written with ink. Instead, you're our letter of recommendation. Yes. Because the gospel that we preach, when you believed it by faith, the Holy Spirit did the work that he does. And proved that this gospel message changes people's lives. Yeah. These people have a temporary piece of papyrus with temporary ink on it. That's something external like the, the, the stone tablets that were engraved in the Old Testament. External religion, temporary in nature. But what we gave you was the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you believed it, it did something on the inside of you that has eternal value. Because the law kills but the Spirit gives life. You know, every week, pretty much, we uh, talk about the big difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. How in the times of Israel, the presence of God was with them. Amen. But in the New Testament or New Covenant, the presence of God is in us. Even over the last couple of weeks, we've talked a lot about that Ezekiel passage, right? Where it talks about that the Spirit of God was going to give man a new heart. That he was going to renew man's spirit. That he was going to put his spirit inside man. But I want you to know it wasn't just Ezekiel that talked about that. Jeremiah did also. Let's take a look. And this really Jeremiah 31, 31 and verse through 33. This is really what the Apostle Paul is talking about. When he compares the papyrus with ink to the tables of stone. He's talking about this passage that Jeremiah talked about. And this is what Jeremiah said, because Jeremiah right here is talking about the new covenant. Just like Ezekiel talked about the new covenant in Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah is talking about the new covenant right here. He said, behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke. Although I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. The Apostle Paul is basically saying to the church of Corinth, they might be calling me a false preacher, but what I'm here to tell you is, is that the message I preach to you is the fulfillment of what Jeremiah the prophet spoke of. When you heard him, you believed him by faith. God inscribed his law on your heart when the Holy Ghost came to live on the inside of you, and your life has never been the, change, the same because it changes you inwardly, and it becomes manifest outwardly. That's the difference maker. The sacrifice of Jesus paid the death wage of sin, which allows the spirit of life to live in man and makes him a completely new creation. That was point number one. He had to drink the cup. Point number two, a new covenant, a new creation. And this scripture, 2 Corinthians 517, tells the whole story. Amen. It says, therefore, 
if any man be in Christ, I don't have to go up there and draw it on the board, right? You know the picture. Old broken Adam puts faith in Christ and now he's inside of Jesus. Amen. He's in Christ. So what does that mean? Anytime you're in Christ, it means you've already gone through the process. You recognize you were a sinner. You heard the truth of the gospel. You believed it by faith. The old man born of Adam was crucified with Jesus at the cross. The new man in Christ has been resurrected to newness of life. Now you have a new position in Christ and you've been declared justified, which means innocent by God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a whole lot of stuff, but aren't you glad you know what it means? Yes. In Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. A new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We need to be able to understand this. We have such a hard time understanding the forgiveness of God, what justification means, what it means to receive his righteousness as a gift. But just as the old covenant has been done away with because it was inadequate and replaced with the new covenant, which was always God's plan, the new man in Christ is a new creation. And just, this is important right here, just as pure as a newborn babe. A newborn babe. You ever seen a baby skin? I love, I see babies all day long. <laughs> and sometimes you see so many of them, it's kind of hard to stop and appreciate. But they got the, just the most softest skin. A newborn babe, so innocent looking, right? I mean, come on. We know that they're born with a sin nature, but it's kind of hard to tell when they're little bitty babies. Not when they hit about 18 months. It's not that hard to figure out, man. <laughs> Pure as a newborn babe in the eyes of God, the new man gets a clean slate and a fresh start. You want to talk about something new? You want to talk about a new year? You want to talk about a new covenant, a new start, a new heart, amen, a fresh slate? Listen, you know that's the problem with resolutions? Let me tell you. You fail, you feel guilty and unworthy, and you quit. But with God, it's different. It's yes. not, I'm not talking amen. about a license to sin. That's not what I'm talking about. Listen, each and every one of us falls short of the glory of God. But I'm not talking about, and listen, any one of us in here that want to take it that way, including the preacher, guess what? You will. You, you are twisting the word of God. God never talked about a license to sin, but, what it, but it's different. You can't just do whatever you want, but there is forgiveness. There is new life. His mercies are new every morning. Hallelujah. When you fail the Lord, a righteous man, the word of God says in the book of Proverbs, he gets back up. He gets up seven times. Because guess what? God's people are getting up people. There was only one that was without sin. His name was Jesus. That was, that was point number two. A new, a new covenant, a new creation. Point number three. It required work to engage the old. It requires faith to access the new. It required work to engage the old. It requires faith to access the new. Philippians 3 verses 8 through 10. This is the Apostle Paul again. A master at dissecting the new covenant. He says, yeah, doubtless, and I count all things, but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He lost a lot of things from his old life. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. It is like a pile of poop. Everything that I had before, before I came to Jesus, is like a pile of poop. It looked real important back then, but that's all it is, is dung. You ever stepped in a cow patty on accident? That's a mess. I won't tell you about my father-in-law's past. He grew up on a farm, but that's another story for another time. I know you're ready for that. All right. <laughs> that I may win Christ and be found in him. There it is again. In him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. The beauty of the righteousness of Christ allows me to become molded to the death of Jesus where the old man born of Adam dies and to experience the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. There's a resurrection side to Calvary that, and that the same spirit that raised him from the dead will also quicken your mortal body. Amen. And give you the power of the Holy Ghost in order to live for God on this side of, of eternity. You know, 
the things that he was referring to that he lost was his old life, his old way of thinking regarding the old covenant, the circumcision, his affiliation with the tribe of Benjamin, all that stuff. And what he refers to gaining is his new life in Christ. The righteousness of Jesus that he was given. Amen. And like we said, his death in Christ and his the access to resurrection power. But look at verse 9. Because we're talking about faith. And be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. It's, it's through faith we must first hear the truth of the new covenant and no matter how foolish it may sound to some, the hearer must, be, must respond by faith. And once we do, we experience the new life of the new creation. Amen. I want to close with a story out of the Old Testament. You can read it if you want to later on on your own time, but I'm just going to try to tell you the story. It comes out of 2 Kings chapter 5. During this time, Syria was a powerful, dominant country. They had defeated many other nations, and the king of Syria had become very powerful, and much of his success was the result of a general of his army, and the general's name was Naaman, and the Bible describes him with some adjectives. It said he was great, which means mighty. He was honorable. He was a trustworthy man for this king. He was a man of valor, and the word valor means great substance. It can describe riches and prosperity. We don't know for sure whether or not he had a lot of riches and prosperity. I would imagine that he did, but whether it was rich with the skill of war or rich with prosperity or treasure or both, he was a man of valor, but he had a problem. The Bible says he was a leper. Now, we've taught about leprosy before and how in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, they had to, because it was, a, it, we now know that it's also known as Hansen's disease, it's caused by bacteria, and essentially, we've pretty much, for the most part, been able to get rid of it because antibiotics treat it. But back then, they didn't know what it was, and it would cause deformity. The bacteria would eat away at the flesh, and it would cause a deformity, and it would cause you to become very, like, pieces of their body would come off. They would lose nerve feeling and, you know, well, I mean, rats would chew off their fingers or their toes, their nose. They would have to wear, uh, they would cover their face because of disgrace, right, as, as time went on and the, the disease would ravage their body. And because it was infectious and they realized that much about it, they would have to walk, and I've shared this with you before, on the other side of the street. And they would have themselves covered up and they would have to holler out, unclean, unclean, so that people would know that they were leprous. And can you imagine the social isolation? But he was a leper, and he was a general, and he was a mighty man of valor. You know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of, on this earth, that have a lot of really good attributes. Many that have good looks, money, intellect, even great personalities. But they're plagued with a problem. Just as Naaman was plagued with leprosy and desperately needed a remedy, such is the plight of the human race. In reference to the plague of sin. In one of the battles that Naaman had against Israel, there was a little girl that was left on the battlefield, a little Israelite girl. The Bible doesn't tell us whether she was found weeping and crying uncontrollably over the bodies of her parents. We don't know that. The Bible doesn't explain to us how she got there. The Bible just tells us that there was a battle that obviously Naaman won. This little Israelite girl was left on the battlefield. He scooped her up. He brought her home. He put her in his house where she served his wife as a little servant girl. The Bible teaches us that one day she was over her talking to Naaman's wife. I can see her. She's full of life. Even though things could have been a whole lot worse. They obviously were treating her good. She loved her master Naaman. But she felt sorry for him. And she was overheard uh, saying with excitement in her voice, I wish that my master could get to the prophet in Israel. Oh! If he could just get to the prophet in Israel, I know that he would be made whole. She reminds me of a little uh, New Testament Christian. You know what I'm saying? Fresh on fire for the Lord, excited, knowing that seeing the unsaved as people that are plagued with an infectious disease like leprosy, but at the same time knowing that there's an answer that can set them free, going around and letting people know, amen, that, that, that they can be set free. Someone overheard that little girl going on about the prophet Elijah and this news made it to the king of Syria who wanted to send money and clothes as gifts to the king of Israel because he wanted to see his powerful general 
healed of the leprosy. And he figured, hey, I'll send this money, I'll send these clothes to the king of Israel, and then maybe he'll do this favor for me. He'll put my general in contact with this prophet Elisha, who this little girl keeps saying that, oh, if he could just get a hold of the prophet in Israel. Well, when the king of Israel received the letter, he ripped his clothes. He ripped his clothes because he didn't have the faith of the little girl. Fear grabbed a hold of his heart. He saw the situation unfolding before his eyes, and he could see it all unraveling and failing before him. Oh, they're going to send me the money. They're going to send me the clothes. I'm going to set up the meeting. The healing's not going to take place. Surely I'm going to die. The king of Syria is going to destroy me. When Elisha heard about the king's response and the ripping of his clothes, he sent word to him. He said, hey, tell him to come on over here. Tell him to come on over here and he will see that indeed there is a prophet. Amen. 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 Elisha didn't even wait for Naaman to get there and he didn't even go to meet him himself. He sent a servant to notify him how he could be healed. And this is what he told him. The servant told Naaman all he had to do was dip himself in the Jordan River seven times. All you gotta do, hey, I've been sent and dispatched to tell you. You don't even have to make it all the way to the prophet's house. All you gotta do is go get in the Jordan River and dip yourself seven times and you will be healed of your malady. Isn't this how God moves in our lives? He will send a little witness to us, just like that little girl, to tell us the good news of the gospel. Then he'll send his servant. Jesus doesn't come back down here to earth each and every time, but instead what he does, he sends the Holy Spirit Amen. to remind us and to remind us of what the plan is, to tell us all you got to do is just take an action of faith. All you got to do is trust in God's plan, and you will see yourself. Amen. The Holy Spirit, he just wants to get us to the place of faith so he can do the miracle of cleansing in our lives. But the Bible says that Naaman was wroth. means he was full of anger. He said aloud, Aren't Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, much better than the rivers of Israel? It didn't make any sense to his logical mind. His intellect was offended. All you got to do is look at the rivers of Syria and you can see the crystal clear waters versus the turbid, dirty waters of the Jordan River. And they want me to go dip in the Jordan instead of Abana and Farpar. This makes no sense. It just angers me for you to even tell me that something like that. He had a, the answer to his dilemma made no sense to his intellect. He was offended because logically it couldn't work. Almost about kind of like the story of Jesus dying on the cross. To some people, it makes no sense. Logically, it can't work. How can the death of some 33-year-old Jew on two pieces of wood bring eternal life? Finally, his own servants convinced him that he had nothing to lose. It may not make any sense, but why not give it a try? I mean, you're absolutely miserable the way you are. What could it hurt to right, give it a try? Man. And so he did. The Bible says that Naaman went into that water seven times. The very water that John the Baptist was baptizing people in to prepare their hearts to receive the new covenant as the Messiah was promised to come. John could feel it in his spirit. He was coming. He was on the way. Amen. The very water that Jesus himself was baptized in by John the Baptist hundreds of years later. New cut seven times he was dipped into that water, which is the number of completion and fulfillment. The Bible says that after Naaman came up that seventh time, his skin was as new as the skin of a child. And there you have it. A message of hope landing on hurting ears, a response of faith from the hearer, and the result of a new creation. A perfect Old Testament type of entrance into the new covenant. Amen. So this new year, amen, is a time for us to be resolved to learn about and to trust in the new covenant and whatever it is that ails us, whatever it is that we need, God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will give us the strength that we need in order to walk with him.